it's a new year and it's a new Kotlin version. Kotlin 2.3 is packed with nice updates. So let's take a look at what they are together. We'll talk about new language features like the unused return value checker and explicit backing fields, all the previously ended language features that have become stable in this release, new APIs for time and UUID handling in the standard library, and improvements to all Kotlin platforms, from native to WASM and JS. So let's dive in. The first feature that we'll look at is the unused return value checker. Most of the time, when you have a function that returns a value, that value is meaningful and its caller should do something with it. This new checker will make this easy to enforce and help you prevent bugs that are caused by silently ignoring a return value. To see how this works, let's take a look at this example function here, which takes a name as a parameter and returns an appropriate greeting. It has separate handling for names that are empty or blank. It has a branch that handles names that don't contain spaces, so they're just a single word. And it also has the rest of the logic, which splits a name into first name and last name, and then generates a greeting based on those. It also contains a bug, which you may or may not have spotted as we went through this function. Namely, on this branch, we're creating a string, but we're not actually returning it. So if I run this function with a single name as a parameter, you'll see that this will actually fail with an exception because we are trying to split a name which doesn't have a space in it. This is something that we could have spotted if we were using the unused return value checker. So I'll go ahead and actually enable that now by going to my build configuration and setting it to check mode. With this option, the checker will produce warnings on APIs that are already marked as having important return values, like most functions in the standard library. Going back to our code, you can see that there is now a warning here where we are concatenating strings with an operator and then not using the return value of that last plus function. So it points us to a possible problem and it lets us fix our mistake by adding a return here. Over time, we're looking for all Kotlin code, including third-party libraries, to add this kind of information about their return values so that callers know which ones may or may not be ignored. To get started, you can start adding annotations to files or classes to indicate that functions within those scopes should not be ignored and then anyone who has the checker turned on will start seeing the appropriate warnings. For example, if I add the must use return values annotation to my current file, you'll see that that opts in all of the functions in this file, such as the greet function, which returns a string, but I've actually been forgetting to use it in the main function. To fix this warning, I have to use the return value of this function somehow. I could assign it to a variable like this, or I could pass it to another function. Uh, let's say I want to print this, so I could pass it to the print line function just like that. You can also mark entire modules at a time as having meaningful return values in their functions using the full mode of the checker. If you choose this configuration option, you will no longer need to add the annotations on top of your files because all functions will be considered to have meaningful return values by default. Of course, there are cases where functions have ignorable return values, which aren't meaningful in every scenario and users are not expected to check them every single time. You can mark these functions with the ignorable return value annotation, for example, I can mark this one and this will turn off any warnings about return values of that function for any of its users. Functions that return unit or nothing are also ignorable by default as those are not meaningful values and it doesn't make sense to produce warnings about them. Finally, you can also ignore values at the call site if necessary. For example, if I was sure that I wanted to call this greet function but I did not care about its return value, I could always assign it to an unnamed variable which is indicated by an underscore like this. Next, let's take a look at explicit backing fields, which is another new and experimental feature in Kotlin 2.3, which I've already enabled here in my build configuration. Let's say that you're working with a class like this, which contains a mutable type that it has to be able to modify internally, like the mutable state flow in this property, but then it wants to expose that same value to the users of the class as a read-only type, like this state flow property here. The classic pattern is to have two properties like this, with a public facing read only one, which simply returns the same value as the private mutable variable, but stripping it from the mutable type. Using this approach means that you'll have to define two separate properties for essentially the same value. And you'll also need to give them different names, for example, by using an underscore prefix for the private version of the variable. Let's see how we can make this nicer using the new feature. Instead of defining two properties, I'll define just one property with the public name and read only type. Then I can customize the backing field that's used privately within the class by using the field keyword and then initializing it as previously by creating that mutable state flow like this. 
So the public facing API of our class is still the exact same, but within the class, we know that this is actually a mutable state flow. So whenever we try using that property, it will receive a smart cast to the more specific mutable type so that we can easily modify the values. I didn't have to create two separate properties and I don't have to deal with a separate name which starts with an underscore. So this was a brief look at our new language features, but we'll also take a closer look at these in upcoming videos. So make sure that you're subscribed and have your notifications turned on to catch those as well. Besides those new features, we also have several features in 2.3 that were previously experimental and are now graduating to stable. This includes nested type aliases, data flow based exhaustiveness checks for when expressions, and support for using return statements in functions with expression bodies. We also continued our work on context sensitive resolution, improving it in certain edge cases, but in this release it still remains experimental, so please try it and send feedback our way. We already explored all four of these features in earlier videos, so you can find those all linked in the description if you want to learn more. With that, we're done with looking at language features and we'll now take a look at some APIs in the standard library. In Kotlin 2120, we moved the clock and instant types from the Kotlin X datetime library into the standard library's Kotlin time package. These types are now stable, so you can use them for all your time tracking needs without the opt-in annotations. These two types are independent of time zones, which is why we were able to move them into the standard library. If you do need to work with time zones with types like local date time, you'll still want to include the Kotlin X date time library in your project. If you're already using the clock or instant types from Kotlin X date time, you should now migrate your usages to use the standard library APIs instead. To help you with this, we have detailed migration steps published in the readme of the Kotlin X date time library. And there's also a compatibility release of Kotlin X date time in case you depend on libraries that still use the older types. Finally, if you are serializing the instant type, make sure that you update your Kotlin X serialization dependency to 1.9 or newer to get built-in support for it. Let's keep moving and look at UUIDs next. The multi-platform UUID type in the standard library is still experimental, but we have another round of improvements that are ready for you to try. One of the top requests since the initial introduction of the UUID type was to support version 7 time-ordered UUIDs, which contain a timestamp in their first 48 bits and are often used in databases. With Kotlin 2.3, you can now use the uuid.generateV7 function to generate a version 7 UUID. The random function will still generate version 4 UUIDs, but if you want to be more explicit about that, you can use the generateV4 function to generate specifically a version 4 UUID. If you need to create a version 7 UUID for an already known timestamp instead of the current time, you can use uuid dot generate v7 non monotonic at and pass in an instant as a parameter to it. As the name strongly suggests here, this will not have the usual guarantees about being monotonic that version 7 UUIDs would normally come with. So if you generate multiple version 7 UUIDs for the same timestamp, you might not get sequential IDs. Since version 7 UUIDs start with a timestamp, being able to sort them is particularly useful. This can be done very naturally as UUID implements the comparable interface since Kotlin 2.120. So for example, if I wanted to sort all the UUIDs that I've created here so far, I could simply place them into a list and then call the usual sorted function on that. Note here how the sorted function actually returns a new list instead of sorting the existing list in place and how obvious this becomes by the unused return value checker immediately giving me a warning. Finally, as one more UX improvement for UUIDs, we have added or null variants for each of their parsing functions. So you can get a null value instead of having to handle an exception when trying to parse an invalid string as a UUID. For example, I can use the new UUID.parse or null function, and if I pass in an invalid UUID to it, it will just give me a null instead of throwing an exception. We also have a bunch of exciting platform specific changes in this release. But before we get to them, we have a message from our sponsor. KotlinConf. KotlinConf is the developer event of the year for Kotlin developers. Whether you're working on server side, mobile, or anything else, this is the best place to catch up on the latest tech, meet the community, and talk to the Kotlin team from JetBrains in person. And who knows? Maybe you'll even catch Cody there. We'll have more than 100 amazing speakers across five tracks this year and a lot of fun activities outside of the sessions as well. So grab your ticket now and join us in Munich in May. Okay, let's take a look at Kotlin Native next. The team continues to work hard on Swift export, which provides Swift users a more idiomatic API when calling into shared Kotlin code. Previously, Kotlin enums were exported as just regular Swift classes. Now there's a direct mapping to Swift enums instead. This means that I can use all of the syntax on the Swift side that I'm used to with Swift enums. I can grab one of its values with the dot syntax. I can read properties of the enum values 
And I can also iterate through all of the enum cases if I want to. Swift export now also has support for functions that take a variable number of arguments, such as this one, which can take any number of names and then create the appropriate greeting. Then on the Swift side, you can call this with a comma separated list of values, like you would for any variadic function in Swift. Another area that the Kotlin native team is working on is build performance. In Kotlin 2.3, we shipped several improvements which will speed up build times for release tasks, such as link release framework iOS ARM64. In our benchmarks, release builds can be up to 40% faster depending on the size of the project. Let's take a look at Kotlin Wasm next. Until now, when building with Kotlin Wasm, the compiler didn't store the fully qualified names of classes in the generated binaries by default to avoid increasing the application size. In Kotlin 2.3, fully qualified names for Wasm builds are now enabled by default. This makes it easier to write common code that relies on those qualified names by using the K class qualified name property. What makes this possible now is a new optimization for string storage. For strings that only use the Latin one character set, which contains about 200 common characters, Kotlin Wasm now stores them in UTF-8 instead of UTF-16, which significantly reduces the size of metadata. We have measured these changes on the Kotlin Confab project, where enabling the new UTF-8 string storage gave us 13% smaller binaries. Even with fully qualified names then enabled, binaries will still 8% smaller compared to previous Kotlin versions. These size reductions are of course especially important for the web, as they will make the initial download and startup times of WASM applications faster. We also have improvements to JavaScript export in this release. For one, you can now export Kotlin suspending functions using the JS export annotation, without having to write extra wrappers to handle this. On the JavaScript side, these become promises, so you can simply await their results. We also improved how the Kotlin long array type is exported. It now uses the built-in big int 64 array type in JavaScript, which makes using functions accepting or returning long arrays more natural to use from the JavaScript side. Both of these new export features are experimental and behind compiler flags, so check the release notes to see how you can enable them. You'll also find all the other information about JavaScript improvements in this release there. For example, we now have a uniform way of accessing companion objects across all JavaScript module systems. We added support for using the JAesthetic annotation in companion objects of interfaces, which wasn't possible before. And we now have the new jsexport.default annotation, which you can use to mark something as a default export, instead of having to hack it with a cleverly crafted JS name annotation. Okay, I think that's just about everything. Of course, there are lots of smaller changes that we didn't touch on in detail here. For example, on the JVM, the compiler can now generate Java 25 bytecode. We are removing support for some of the older language version settings in the compiler. We are raising the minimum versions of Apple targets that we support. And we no longer support the Ant build system. We still support it, Ant? Well, the more you know. Anyway, if you want to dig deeper into this release, you can check out the written version of the What's New page, which is linked in the description below. And as always, have a nice Scotland.